Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. In South Korea, military service is a mandatory rite of passage for each and every able-bodied male citizen. Conscription is strictly enforced, and public opinion has very little tolerance for draft dodgers. Our guest for this episode, Yong Chun, learned this the hard way. Born the son of Korean immigrants in Champaign, Illinois, and raised in Chicago and Seattle, he traveled to Korea at the end of 2002. He soon discovered that he was listed as a Korean citizen despite his parents acquiring U.S. citizenship. The Korean army wasted no time to draft him, and with his little command of Korean, Young had to start his service in January 2004. He served both in Korea and Afghanistan. Young wrote about his tough experience in his first book, The Accidental Citizen Soldier, which sheds a unique light from an outsider's perspective on life in the Korean military, its hardships, and sometimes its absurdity. He currently resides in South Korea and teaches English at Seoul National University. Yong Chun, welcome to Korea and the World. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Why did you decide to come to Korea as an English teacher at the age of, of 24? What is maybe your, your life story and why did you want to experience Korea in a nutshell? It wasn't so much that I wanted to experience Korea. Uh, the decision was primarily financially motivated. Like, like many college graduates, I had a good amount of college loans and uh, a good amount of credit card debt. <laughs> And as an art school graduate, I couldn't find a job, especially in a weak Seattle economy at the time. I and so guess. teaching was like an opportunity there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you went to the uh, Incheon Immigration Office to apply for your, your teaching visa, and something unexpected yeah. happened. Yeah. So I, I prepared all my paperwork, and I went up to the, to the desk, and the officer started typing. And <laughs> he started typing some more. And then he, he looked at me, and he said, you can't get a visa. Uh, you're a Korean citizen, which was the first time I'd ever heard of that. And how, how could that happen? What, what, what is the story of your Korean citizenship? Uh, as far as I had known, my parents are American citizens, and they have always been American citizens in my memory. You were uh, born in the U.S. Yes, and mm. I was born in the U.S. But what actually had happened was my parents came to America in 1973, and they didn't become naturalized until about a year after I was born. So they were still Korean citizens. And so someone uh, apparently reported my birth in Korea. And I was put on the Hojok, the family register. And therefore, I was a Korean citizen as well. So I, I had both citizens from birth. I just didn't know it. And um, as of today, were you able to find out who actually uh, registered you, reported you? <laughs> uh, it's, it's still a mystery. It's still a mystery. According to the Hojok, it says that my father uh, reported my birth. Uh, he denies it. And he's... I, I just assume that when he got naturalized a year after I was born, he would have renounced my citizenship as well, if he had known. Mm-hmm. He says that it was my grandfather, but according to the Hojuk, my grandfather passed away before I was born. Yeah, it's just a big mystery. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of wrong information on there. For example, my birthplace, my brother's birthplace, etc. And so at the immigration office, you discover that you are Korean. Yeah. And then suddenly, it was at that time, or was it a few years later, the Korean government told you now you have to go um, and serve in the army like any Korean citizen? <laughs> it, was, it was actually later that year. Did you, how did you try to avoid it? Could, could the U.S. Embassy maybe help you? No. When, when reading the book, it seems that like you really hit a wall there. Uh, that's definitely it. Mm. U.S. law cannot uh, protect U.S. citizens who have nationality of that country. The laws of that country apply to that if, if you have that nationality. So basically, they were unable to help me. I think the lady at the counter, uh, when I went to there to ask for their help, I think she didn't really think I was American because when I went up there and I asked, you know, oh, the Korea, Korea is trying to draft me, you know, can you help me? And she basically gave me a phone book of government phone numbers and she just said, take care of it yourself. I tried to explain that I couldn't speak Korean, and she just ignored me. So in the book, you describe how you tried to, well, escape the draft. Uh, You even tried to enlist in the U.S. military to somehow get out of the country, because obviously you couldn't Mm -hmm. leave by any legal means, right? You had a notice to stay in Korea. Um, Can you maybe tell us what you did and how how it (laughs) turned out? I had many different plans. A lot of them were not really feasible. Such as what what kind of ideas (laughs) did you have? Um, Have you read uh, Farewell to Arms? In the book, (laughs) Lieutenant Henry, he's trying to escape from the war. And so he basically gets a rowboat and he 
rose to freedom with his wife. So I, I was thinking of plans to somehow get to Japan, <laughs> rowboat if I had to. But、uh, before I could actually really look into those plans,、uh, my coworker, her husband was a U.S. soldier, and she, she told me that a recruiter told her that they could get me out of the country if I signed up for the U.S. Army. So I met with the recruiter, and I went through the whole process.、Uh, I got my MOS, which is a military occupational specialty, my job.、Mm. Uh, decided my term of service, had my physical tests. Got sworn in before a high-ranking officer in the Stars and Stripes. Got my military ID card and orders to go to basic training, and I went down to Osan Air Base to catch my flight to basic training. And、uh, when I was in Osan Air Base,、uh, I was in line for my flight, and the line was moving very slowly. And、uh, by the time I got to the front of the line,、uh, I realized the reason was because there was an immigration counter, and same kind of thing. They they started typing in the computer. Uh, and they, they said, "Step on a line." They took me to their office and detained me there until my flight left. And then they sent me back to Yongsan. Two days later, I was in the Korean army. Wow! So as you explain in, in the book, your Korean was very limited at the、yes. time.、Um, how did you survive in the military with your little command of, of Korea?、Uh, you know, as they say, "Fake it till you make it."、Uh, basically, I I just tried to copy what everybody else was doing and、uh, try not to screw up too much. Uh, until I could pick up on what everybody else is doing. But didn't the Korean authorities see this as a, as a reason not to draft you? And what what is the、uh, point of having you in the army when you can't even speak the language?、Uh, that's a very good question. It was I, I'm sure it never really crossed our mind that I didn't belong there. It, it's actually a, kind of a reflection of the political situation at the time. Just to give some background,、mm-hmm. uh, in 2002, the singer Yoo Seung Jun, Stephen Yoon, a、uh, Yoo,、uh, he. Went on TV and he is very proud of the fact that he was planning to go to the army and serve. At the time, many celebrities、uh, kind of found ways to evade service, and so he was kind of the golden boy of the media. And then all of a sudden, he got American citizenship and renounced his citizenship, so he didn't have to go to the army anymore. And the public was incensed, and the government took steps and they. Blacklisted him. He couldn't come back to Korea. But at the same time, they also tightened the、uh, regulations. Kind of, yeah. Re- yeah, the regulations about who is exempted from service. And it just happened that I came at the end of that year. I heard that prior to that incident, it was actually pretty easy to get out of the army. Just having tattoos could get you out of the army. And after the Asian financial crisis in ninety seven, ninety eight. There were actually a lot of young men who wanted to go to the army because they couldn't find jobs,、mm. and so they were kind of turning people away. And then in 2002, that happened, and they started tightening the restrictions.、And、so you were also the victim of bad timing, so、yeah. to speak. Yeah. But since you didn't speak、uh, Korean, there were obviously various steps、uh, in your basic training or in your enrollment when they realized you. Well, you were useless. <laughs> so didn't didn't someone at some point decide that you should maybe put aside or, or you know just drop it? There were many opportunities for. The army or the government to realize that I, I couldn't speak Korean.、Uh, I think there was always this kind of suspicion that maybe I was faking it、mm-hmm. that I actually could speak Korean.、Uh, during boot camp, it was ob- re- really obvious that I couldn't speak Korean and I couldn't follow along. And before the army, when I went to get my physical examination,、uh, it starts with a psych evaluation, a psych questionnaire. And、uh, I looked at the questions. There were probably you know, hundreds of questions, and I looked at them. I couldn't answer any of them.、Hmm. I couldn't answer them wrong if I wanted to.、Um, and so I told them, and they said, "Well, just sit there quietly and don't do anything." And then when I handed it in, I, again I told them, "I can't speak Korean. I didn't do it." And they kind of just clucked at me and then just left. And then I went through all of the tests, and at the end, there are kind of there's this big room. With、uh, different sections, and、uh, there's a kind of a doctor related to each section,、mm-hmm. and you kind of plead your case for each each one. And at the end,、uh, there's a desk, and they say, "Well, do you have anything else to add?" And I said, "I can't speak Korean." And the guy said, "Okay." And then I went up to the ticket counter where、uh, this is this machine,、mm-hmm. and it printed out my results, and it said active duty, and I thought that was really strange, and. When I was in basic training, all of the officers knew that I couldn't speak Korean. My platoon leader, he would basically babysit me when I couldn't、uh, do anything.、Uh, I remember one time, 
everybody was、uh, writing letters, and he knew that I couldn't write a letter to anybody because there was, there was no international mail on base.、Mm. And so he kind of just sat there with me, and he kind of helped me write my personal information sheet、uh, because it was all Greek to me. I didn't, I didn't know. And so、mm. I, there was another time where a different squad leader came, and he got me while everybody else was writing letters. And he went over my notes, which were horrible. And he actually, instead of fixing my notes, he just opened to a new page and just wrote out everything、uh, related to guard duty because I couldn't understand anything related to guard duty.、Um, right before I went to、uh, Afghanistan, I, I got a furlough to prepare, and I went to the local office and I asked for an ID card. Well, if I was serving in the Korean Army, might as well get some of the rights and benefits of、mm-hmm. a Korean citizen. And、uh, so I went to the office to get to apply for an ID card, and they said、uh, you can't get an ID card. You're American citizen. And then I said, Well, I'm in the army. Can't you do something for me? And they said, Why are you in the army? And that was the question I wanted to ask them. And I asked, Can I get a passport? And they said, No, you're an American. You'd have to cancel,、uh, renounce your American citizenship to get a passport. And so I left feeling frustrated. <laughs> And annoyed, and right before the deployment to Afghanistan, they had to get official passports for all of the conscripts. And the personnel, non-commissioned officer, he went and he had a hard time, but somehow he managed to get it. And I know that there had to be some interaction with the government at all these steps, but they didn't think of my inability to speak Korean as a valid reason to exempt me from the service. Your first experience of how tough army life is was. The initial boot camp.、Mm-hmm. Um, can you maybe tell us about your experience there and how was you know the dynamics、uh, among the conscripts and how, how did you try to fit in? I actually didn't try to actively fit in.、Uh, I was too busy just trying to survive. In terms of camaraderie、um, among conscripts, everybody, all the recruits were all, all, all starting at the same time. As time went along, people started to build bonds.、Um, of course, because of the language barrier, I wasn't really able to build really close bonds, and also. There's a rule that、uh, recruits aren't allowed to talk to each other during the day, so most of the talking happens like in whispers or、mm. after lights out. To add insult to injury,、uh, your military file、uh, in the army mentioned your 22 years spent in the U.S.、Yeah. So as a result, every time someone needed translation, you would be summoned to perform translation. But obviously, you couldn't really speak Korean, so they would find out. And you know, so can you maybe tell us a few stories and, and how you dealt with that? Um, I dealt with it very poorly.、Um, I wish my Korean had been good enough at the time to explain that I couldn't translate or I couldn't interpret,、um, but it wasn't. And so basically, I would just、uh, tag along with these officers, and I would be put in a situation where I had to interpret, and I would miss most of the content, and I would just translate what I could, which was very rudimentary. It was like, you know, there'd be. In an officer t- speaking, and then basically I would be making him into、like、an elementary school student、um, <laughs> by what he was saying. You know what I could translate. It was very stressful、uh, because you know there's a breakdown in communication, and also the officers. I could tell that they were disappointed and angry. And so at some point, I think it's after a hundred days in the army,、mm-hmm. you decided that you had enough, and you applied for deployment in Afghanistan. Can you maybe explain the whole rationale and was it that bad or did you want、yeah. to? At the time, a conscript made about thirty thousand won per month, which is about thirty U.S. dollars.、Mm-hmm. And for the deployment, they were paying about one point five million won per month, danger pay and all that. And my my family, my mother and my brother were paying off my school loans and my debts, credit card debts. And I, I really felt bad about that, so I wanted to kind of become more financially、mm. <laughs> responsible, I guess.、Uh, at the same time, I also really did want to escape from Daegu. I just couldn't handle it there.、Um, it was really frustrating those first couple months in in Daegu. The culture there, the way that people would pick on me, it was it was really frustrating. I just I couldn't handle it anymore. I, I needed to go somewhere else. And、um, how was your experience in Afghanistan? Would you say the Korean Army had really a role to play there, or were you just there for shows to, you know, to signal support for the U.S. operations, but not much, you know, usefulness there. It was more of a symbolic gesture, I think. 
as far as I could tell, we didn't really do much. There was an engineering unit and a medical unit. Basically, we just poured concrete, as far as I know, poured concrete around the base, and I think that's about it. Uh, the medical unit, they uh, treated local nationals, which I, I think is actually uh, better, mm-hmm. but I was with the engineers. <laughs> and so your daily tasks in Afghanistan were? Uh, I was working for intelligence and operations. Uh, basically, I would stay in the TOC, which is short for uh, Tactical Operations Center, and I'd type up reports and look at reports and not really translate, but I would translate or interpret for meetings, uh, base-wide meetings. Because at that time, your Korean had obviously gone... No, it was no, still, still pretty so <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, during the meetings, there wasn't anything to say. All I really had to say was nothing to report. And so <laughs> it, was, it was actually a load off my mind. So you were um, a Korean-American, but with little to no exposure um, to Korean culture. What are the things that struck you the most in the Korean military? I guess this, the hierarchical nature of uh, society, which is amplified in the army. During my time in Korea, before I went to the army, I didn't really experience it very much because I was just working, um, teaching English. There wasn't really uh, much going on. And so it came really as a surprise just how seriously they took this hierarchy and how they used it as a license to treat others really poorly. <laughs> How were you treated as a Korean American? How did you, how did your fellow conscripts see or react to, to this uh, identity? Did they, did they consider you a, a real Korean or? There are kind of two main reactions to who I was. Uh, the first was kind of I was a curiosity. I was this American uh, in quotation marks, I guess, and that kind of made me a target because. It just made me something of a curiosity, and you know, a curiosity attracts attention. And there are a lot of people who are very bored during the service, and they need some kind of outlet for their boredom and their frustration. And so, uh, I was frequently the target of these people. But for the most part, everybody kind of just considered me a Korean because I was in the Korean army. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just considered me a very dumb Korean who <laughs> couldn't speak and uh, didn't really know what was going on. What is what is um, striking in your book is really the the sheer incompetence and the, the the constant verbal abuse and all the futility of the tasks you have to perform and this this relentless focus on ranks and seniority even among the fa- among these very young young men young boys even so from your book you really get the feeling that the Korean army is somewhat broken I'm even tempted to say useless is that the reality or is that the anger you know coming out when you were reading writing your book um, you know is there something that is at the core rotten in, in the yeah. Korean army actually in, in writing the book I wanted to sound as neutral as possible um, I wanted to let the reader kind of make their own decisions but I, I guess a degree of bitterness mm. is inevitable I, I really didn't want to sound like I was complaining about my experience but I really wanted to kind of just paint a picture of what it was like and s- you use the term broken and kind of is like that. Hmm. Is this the, the sad reality of most army corps in the world? Or is this specific to the, to the Korean army? And how, how do you explain it? Maybe also in comparison with what you saw in Afghanistan with the U.S. Army or hmm. other army corps. Personally, I think it's very specific to the Korean army. And it was, it was definitely clear in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, I, I was able to interact with soldiers from a, a wide variety of countries. Uh, Poland, Slovakia, the the U.S., uh, Egypt, the United Arab Arab Emirates. And for the most part, interactions between soldiers, between officers and enlisted men, uh, was very civil. Um, They they would joke around. um, They were friendly with each other. Uh, Of course, when they had to get work done, they would obey the chain of command. But when it wasn't necessary, they were very friendly. Even, but even the officers from the other countries are very uh, civil to me. One time they even uh, offered me alcohol, which is prohibited on base. And I had to check with my officer first before I could accept it. Um, but I, I just, it was really refreshing to see how soldiers from other countries interacted with each other. Hmm. One of the incidents you mention in your book and while you were in Afghanistan is that a Korean soldier dropped his rifle in the mess hall. And apparently uh, it wasn't that big of a deal, even though from the U.S. perspective, it was a, a serious incident. So can you maybe tell us about that event and how it you know, explains or, or shows the, the, the mentality in the Korean army that is maybe should, should, should change? 
Well, that that particular incident, it wasn't an isolated incident. It happened all the time. It was fine for the most part because it happened uh, in our own areas. But there were situations like that time uh, I was escorting an American soldier and he was visibly shocked by that experience. And if they were outside somewhere else in some common areas and they had done that, uh, it definitely would cause alarm because uh, it's a base regulation. Uh, everybody knows it that you have to carry live rounds with you at all times. But the Korean soldiers, none of us had live ammunition, but we didn't, most soldiers didn't know about the regulation. Mm. And so I, I saw a lot of ridiculous things dropping rifles, um, which um, my friend told me a soldier had actually gotten wounded by a rifle getting dropped. And, and why do the Koreans not carry live? Uh, so this is just hearsay, but what what actually had happened was one to that day, to that point, uh, only one Korean soldier had died in Afghanistan, and he had been killed by another soldier, mm. uh, a Korean soldier, and so they figured it would be safer if <laughs> we just didn't have live live ammunition. Did the base command know about this these practices? I don't believe so. Mm. Um, do you know whether anything has changed since your term uh, in the army? Actually, the past year saw announcements of wide-ranging reforms regarding the abuse of recruits. Um, can we possibly expect that the situation in the Korean army is now very different from what you experienced, which was already more than 10 years ago? I do believe that it is getting better. When you're at the bottom, there's no place to go but up. But also, it's just kind of a general, it's kind of general knowledge that the army is just progressively getting better, where people who served 10 years before you will say, well, you don't know how hard we had it, mm. and you'll be saying the same thing to people who served 10 years later than you. I do know that they have shortened the service again. I do know that they are paying uh, soldiers more. Uh, still not very much, but a lot more than uh, I got paid when I was a soldier. And I did see it when, actually did see it towards the end of my service. In, 2000, in the summer of 2005, there was an incident uh, at the GOP, uh, which is kind of the area along uh, the front between uh, South and North Korea. And uh, a soldier, he killed a whole bunch of uh, his fellow soldiers. He threw a grenade in the barracks and you know, shot a couple of people. And after that, um, they started pressing reforms mm. uh, to, to make things better. And so I did see things get uh, a little bit better for uh, the conscripts under me. It was kind of a pity that it came at a time when it was too late for me. Mm. Um, but it, it's also a sad reality that it takes kind of incidents like that, really sad events like that, to cause reform uh, in the military culture. I think a lot of observers of Korean society believe that this mandatory military service, long military service, shapes the mindset of these young men who are obviously at that tender age very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And it explains why some issues in Korean society have remained unaddressed such as this, as you mentioned, heavy focus on hierarchy, traditional values, and maybe to some extent, patriarchy and even sexism. So how was your experience in the army? Do you feel that these young men were definitely changed and interior, interiorized conservative norms? And did it change you? Uh, I, I do believe that uh, military service does teach young men in Korea a lot of bad habits that last for a lifetime and can probably explain a lot of uh, societal woes. And I often hear uh, people compare their workplaces to the army. Mm -hmm. I'm sh sure a lot of them kind of, it kind of concretes this familiarity with the hierarchical structure. Uh, I, I'm also sh sure that a lot of conscripts also visit their, uh, their first brothel during the service. Mm -hmm. uh, but personally for me, I, I don't feel like I've changed uh, very much. I was much older than the average mm. conscript, and I'm also very stubborn. And at the same time, I also felt like I was an outsider in the army uh, during the whole time, and I preferred to keep it that way. Did your age actually help, you know, by somehow preventing more abuse since you would have at least have the respect of age? Mm, no. Mm. Um, it would have helped if I had gone to a different unit, but the unit that I was serving in, there were actually a lot of older soldiers. Mm. Um, not a majority but enough so that it wasn't such uh, a big deal and because there were so many older soldiers uh, the younger soldiers felt like they needed to kind of establish their authority through uh, the hierarchy. Mm. Um, so you mentioned that 
conscripts being bored would you know find try to find something to do which would include picking on mm. the oddball. Um, but didn't the brass try to prevent that, or is that considered somehow part of the training process? For the most part, as long as there's no fighting, they don't really care. Uh, there is only one officer, uh, our company commander, in our company, and he, for the most part, stayed in his office and didn't really, you know, take account of mm. what was happening in the company. Did anything change for you once you came back from Afghanistan? Did your tour earn you more respect, or did you? Instead, you just resume your previous positions. I resumed my previous positions. The only benefit was that uh, most of my tormentors, when I was a private, were gone. They had uh, and, and your Korean was better. I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, it was. It was. I. I. I'm hoping it was. A, uh, it was better, but there was another uh, Republic of Korea uh, U.S. Uh, joint exercise a couple months later. And I was forced to interpret and translate, and I realized at that point that I still couldn't do it. Maybe a tough question, but there was a very important study in 2007 by Professor Kwon Insuk, and she showed that slightly more than 15 percent, which is huge, of conscripts experience sexual violence or some form of sexual violence uh, in the army. So, have you ever witnessed anything of that sort? What, is it a topic? Mm-hmm. You know, that was. Um, of course, I've heard stories and I've read of stories. And I guess it depends on what your definition of sexual mm. harassment is. Um, I didn't see anything extreme. I, I saw some light things, you know, like higher rank soldiers, like hugging, you know, forcing the other. It was, it was just in play mm. uh, for the most part. I didn't really see any kind of bad cases. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing that does seem to change for young men uh, once they're done with military duty is their perception of North Korea and you know they have more the sense that North Korea is a real threat. Um, did you also experience this and did your attitude towards North Korea evolve? Actually I don't know if any of the people around me felt that North Korea was a real threat. Having dealt with, uh, after I came back from Afghanistan I was working in the exercise branch uh, of headquarters which was kind of in charge of organizing and structuring the, the exercise. And uh, one thing that we did was we went through seen possible scenarios uh, of what would happen in the event that North Korea invaded. And even knowing our missile capabilities and our, you know, our reaction capabilities, I still am not any more scared of hmm. North Korea than I was uh, before. How was the relationship between the U.S. Army and the Korean troops uh, in Afghanistan and also here in Korea? Uh, I have to say that from reading your book, it it really felt like communication was difficult, yes, but there's also a lot of contempt on both sides. And how do you explain that? I think a lot of it is cultural. Um, Just you have very different ways of running an army, uh, running a unit. So most of the the conflict actually happened between the officers. Uh, Most of the conscripts, they got along well with soldiers from other countries. Um, But it was really where uh, you had the commands, the commands were off and butting heads. So upon completion of your mandatory uh, military service, you immediately renounced your Korean citizenship, maybe understandably so, but despite this radical act, you are now living and working in South Korea. So what is your relationship to the country right now? Is it, is it a default choice because you felt you couldn't you know, fit in your hometown of Seattle anymore? At least that's what, what you write in the book. Yeah, uh, well, first to address the... Uh, the renouncing of my citizenship, it was by law, I was forced to. Uh, uh, okay. At the time, dual citizenships weren't recognized in Korea. They said, well, within you know, a couple of weeks after you get discharged, you have to choose one. And of course, I chose my American citizenship because my family was still living there. And uh, my decision to live in Korea, it was more of a practical decision. Well, of course, I did, felt like I didn't fit in Seattle. Um, I was no more employable than when I left Seattle. Probably less so because there's a big gap in my employment history. I don't know. I guess I was just looking, at, you know, after this experience, I was just looking for a new start. I just wanted um, to start over in a new place. Hmm. And uh, I could speak Korean, um, finally. Something you gained from the <laughs> army, at least. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, why not? As far as my relationship to Korea, I think uh, my relationship to Korea is no different than any other expatriate. Um, the army is the army, and mm. you know, Korea is Korea. Uh, I've learned to, to separate the two. So you still consider yourself an expat, despite, oh, yes. yeah, yeah, so you're not, okay. Mm. Are you still in contact with any of the people from your time in, in the army? 
And did any of that soul bonding under harsh circumstances that many other soldiers report also happen for you? Do you have any soulmates from the army, to use that word? Yeah, I don't know if uh, there are any soulmates. Uh, there, there are a few people that I occasionally contact. Um, there's one person in particular that I contacted quite regularly who was uh, Ken. But the soul bonding under harsh circumstances, uh, that really didn't happen to, to me. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because uh, I couldn't speak the language, I couldn't really uh, relate to them very mm. much. I kind of just kept to myself for the most part. Would you say your military experience gives you now better credentials, so to speak, among Korean men, you know, because you've been there, so do they respect you because of, or respect you more because of that experience? Do you think it would be a thorn on your, on your side if you had not been to the army as a... Uh, not Particularly, I'm still teaching mm. English, and uh, in my line of work, it doesn't really mm -hmm. come into, it doesn't factor in very often. But in terms of integration yeah. so in Korean uh, society, uh, in, to in terms of like social currency, it's very negligible. I'm not a very social person, first of all. So, mm. and second, uh, I don't think uh, that people who care about that very much are worthwhile to know. <laughs> Young, la last question to conclude. Um, your experience in the Korean army was now over. 10 years ago. Looking back, is there at least one thing positive that came, that came out of it? Personal growth maybe, or the unique story, or do you still have this lingering feeling that you wasted some important years? Um, I'm kind of reluctant to give the army credit for anything, uh, for any kind of growth. I don't know if it's still that bitterness. Um, oh, I guess a couple things. Uh, I guess why well, I, I do have a story to tell. Um, and Another thing is it gave me a lot of time to read and write, um, which I think with the busy pace of uh, people in society, we don't really have a lot of time to read and write. But aside from that, I don't really feel like um, it led to any kind of growth uh, in me. Uh, maybe learning to accept and deal with uh, hard situations. Mm. But I'm actually okay with it being a waste of two years. Um, Maybe that's one thing that I've learned to accept is that uh, the past is the past and the present is the present. Uh, the Accidental Citizen Soldier, your book, is your first uh, major work uh, to be published. Do you have anything else currently in the works? Uh, what can we expect from you in the, in the next few years? Uh, I actually have uh, two books in, in progress right now, uh, and uh, they're both novels. Well, Young, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.